Thank you very much for the introduction. So, here's an outline of my talk. The first half, I'm going to be talking about collision attacks on Cypher blockchaining and CFB modes of operation. This is the part of my talk that has all the practical importance to it, the, the relevance to practice. And then the theoretically interesting thing comes later with the impossible plain text script analysis, right? So there's, there's both, but they are both separate. So I'm talking about block ciphers today. And the, you know, the block cipher uh, will have two inputs, right? A key and a plain text or you know, the cipher text if you're doing decryption. And so I'm going to be focusing on the number of bits in the, the plain text, which I'm denoting as W. And so some good examples of block ciphers, you know, counting the 64-bit block ciphers that are the focus of my presentation. You know, we have things like uh, triple desk, which are still in fairly widespread use, and uh, you know, some other 64-bit uh, block ciphers that are uh, used, as well as the advanced encryption standard and other you know, block ciphers since 2000 that use 128 bits instead of 64. So, you know, just to establish some notation, right? Everybody's familiar with block cipher modes of operation, right? We have plain text. We're going to assume the plain text is uh, can be logically separated into different blocks, and and then we're going to encrypt it and get a sequence of ciphertexts. And the ciphertexts are going to be longer. Uh, they're going to be more ciphertext blocks and plain text blocks. And we're going to ignore uh, some of the details and just focus on the interesting things. So there's a relationship between the plain text block, each plain text block, and the ciphertext blocks, right? And this is going to vary depending on the different modes of operation we're considering. But there's a simple relationship. So we're going to do some attacks. We're going to use a really simple plain text model. So here we've marked all of the plain text known to the attacker in this uh, in a green color. I'll just hold on to this. So the attacker is going to know all of the parts of the green blocks and then none of the parts of the, the silver colored blocks in this presentation. So we're going to define this uh, indicator and for the uh, different modes of operation the, the indicator function is different but it's a function of the ciphertext and when a collision occurs in the indicator block then there's a relationship between the uh, plain text blocks, right? So, you know, the exclusive or the uh, two plain text blocks will equal some value, which is going to depend on what the mode of operation you're in, but it's going to be something that's easy to compute. So, the attacker learns information whenever there's a an indicator block collision that corresponds to uh, a block that's in the unknown set and one that's in the known set. So when this happens, then the attacker can exploit this knowledge, right? So everybody's familiar with the, the birthday bound and you know, the idea of being indistinguishable from random. The, the point here is that we can actually uh, construct an attack that can learn real information and then actually apply this to some real world scenarios. So if the attacker you know, actually knew one plain text block outright and didn't know another plain text block, then it would be easy to um, you know, figure out what the uh, unknown block is. In, in general, it, you can actually you know, do like a, a Bayesian analysis. And if you have partial information about one block and uh, partial information about the other block, then you can do more sophisticated sorts of attacks. And so in principle, uh, this works. It's hard to quantify how well it works because uh, you have to have a sophisticated model of what the, the plain text is. I want to provide a motivating example from the real world. So suppose that the block I is, uh, the, the plain text block I contains uh, a network address. So if you're familiar with uh, uh, your private addressing, these are the, the possible uh, subnets that are allowed for IPv4 uh, addressing. And you can see the interesting thing here is in this bit location we're either 0 or 1 and same thing here. 
Now suppose that plain text block J is uh, ASCII encoded, which means that uh, this bit and that bit location will always be one. Then this, uh, this delta is going to have this form here. So remember that when there was an indicator block collision between these two, then there would be, uh, you know, the exclusive bar of these would be some uh, known value. So an attacker can, you know, look at this information and read off what is the P sub I is, right? You know, since uh, there's, uh, you know, these three are completely distinct. So an attacker can learn what P sub I is and then figure out exactly what P sub J is from that. So this is an example of having partial information about uh, this plain text block and this plain text block and using that to recover uh, all of the plain text. So, and in the real world, the, there are a lot of uh, protocol formats like this that enable you to do inferences. If you look at them, it, it's difficult to quantify uh, exactly how damaging uh, attacks like this are, but there's a lot of examples like this that one can give. So, when does the attack work? So, the, the birthday bound comes into play, right? We have these indicators, like I talked about before. So, we need the, the product of the sizes of these two sets to be the same size as the total set of indicators, or 2 to the power of w. So, they don't have to be equal sized, but you know, this is you know, the generalization of the birthday paradox, right? And these collision-based attacks are very easy to do because they take uh, order and work and storage if you've got uh, you know, n blocks you're attacking. So, because of the break amount, this is not surprising, right? So if you have uh, k known k blocks of known plain text and u blocks of unknown plain text, then you get this simple bound, which is uh, you know, assuming you know, n is the sum of those numbers, and it's quadratic in n. So this is the expected number of blocks, I'm sorry, the expected number of bits of plain text that would leak out, right? It's bounded by this number here. So we have you know, n squared, number of blocks squared, times the number of bits divided by 2 to the power of w with a you know, plus 2 factor in there. So, you know, here's a nice graphic of that. I've got the logarithm of the number of blocks along the bottom, and then the expected number of bits leaked along the vertical. So this is essentially a log-log plot, right, because it's nice to see something like a power log. So the, the interesting thing is that in the real world, it's, it's easy to get to numbers of uh, plain text sizes that uh, get you leaking bits of information, right? So look, all of this applies as long as you don't change the key and you keep encrypting using 64-bit block cipher. And you know, even at a, a gigabyte, you're probably leaking some information. Once you get to a terabyte, you're definitely leaking a lot of information. So the, uh, you know, maybe the best example of this would be for network traffic. So with a 64-bit block cipher, if you encrypt uh, at one gigabit per second for one day, then you're going to be leaking about uh, six million bits of information. So why is this interesting? Well, triple DES is the 64-bit block cipher, and there are um, a good number of encryptors on the market that uh, support gigabit triple DES. So, uh, it's entirely possible that people haven't gotten the word yet and are still doing this, and they should stop. So, uh, you know, the advanced encryption standard or any other 128-bit wide block cipher, you know, you know, um, at a gigabit per second, you know, there's a 10 to the minus three chance it's going to leak a bit of information, right? So, you know, roughly speaking, you know, this highlights. The, how much better 128-bit block ciphers are for uh, you know, modern data rates and data sizes. So, 
you know, if, if one were using a 64-bit block cipher and wanted to mitigate this, then the first thing they, they do would be, let's limit the number of blocks we encrypt under any distinct key. So you can rework the equation you know, that I showed earlier to, to say, well, okay, but I realize if, I'm, if there's some total number of blocks that I'm going to encrypt, I can figure out you know, uh, how much can I rekey if I don't want to leak information. And so an example of that would be if you're going to rekey every million blocks, then the m most you could encrypt would be um, you know, 2 to the 40 blocks. Right? So this is an inherent limitation of this size cipher. And 2 to the 40 is, is great for you know, really constrained environments, but it would be completely inappropriate for something like the, you know, the gigabit encryption example. So, so that covers the, the part of my talk on the collision attacks. Now I want to talk about uh, counter mode. Right? So when I'm talk, let's see, when I say counter mode, what I mean is where we're encrypting a counter. Uh, here we have the, the I claim text block is being encrypted with a block cipher. We're, we're neglecting the key in the notation because it's not important for the attack. We're assuming it's fixed. So we're going to encrypt the you know, counter I and then uh, exclusive pour that into the plain text to get the cipher text. So there's no random knots here and there's no opportunity for a collision that's going to directly leak information. So, you know, using the definition of indistinguishability, you know, counter mode and CVC both have the same level of security, but in practice, actually, you know, counter mode, uh, you know, attacking it is different, and it's actually uh, a bit harder to attack, but let me go through the example. It is possible to, for, it's possible for an attacker to learn information about uh, plain text from, uh, you know, counter mode when you go beyond the, the birthday bound. So let's assume we've got two different blocks, you know, I and J, of plain text that we've encrypted. We also know that, you know, the encryption of I is distinct from the encryption of J, right, from the invertibility of the block cipher. So we know that, you know, this plain text block is not equal to the exclusive or of those three other values. So it's a very small amount of information, but we know that, and we can you know, build up an attack out of this. So what we want to do is extend that observation across multiple known plain texts. And so here we've got, um, you know, again, we're showing plain text blocks up at the top. We have a set of known plain texts here. So On this row, we're showing the, the different blocks that were exclusive or into the plain text. In other words, this is the encryption of I, where you know I would count the blocks along here. We're assuming all our known plain text is bunched up just as a uh, to make the diagram a little cleaner. So we're going to define this uh, epsilon. Capital epsilon is the set of these blocks here that correspond to our known plain text. So, we can extend that observation we made earlier across this set of uh, uh, known plain text blocks and say, okay, what information do we have about, say, this plain text block, right? So, we didn't know any, any information about it in advance, but we know that if you take any of these values and exclusive order them with that, that's the value that will not, this will not be equal to, right? So the, the plain text block will not be in the set of you know, capital epsilon exclusive board with that ciphertext block. So now we're getting somewhere, right? We're composing some information about this. Let me talk about uh, a slightly more sophisticated model of the plain text that we'll need to use to actually make this attack successful. So here we have an example of you know, four emails, right? They're all to bob at example.com. Three of them are from alice at example.com. And one of them is from mailmaster. So 
we're going to define target values to be the thing that the attacker wants. Right? In this case, it's the minimum bid and it's a password. This looks like a human generated password. So when the same value appears multiple times in the message that's encrypted, we're going to call that, we're going to say the value has uh, repetition of, of R, little r there. Right? So this is uh, a repeated value of repetition 4. So this actually does occur in the real world, and this is essential to uh, a successful attack against uh, counter -move. And to be a little bit more sophisticated here, we're also going to consider uh, incidental values that uh, uh, might appear multiple times. So an incidental value would be something that uh, the attacker doesn't actually want to learn the information, but they might learn it as uh, a side effect of prosecuting the attack. And when they learn the information, they, it expands their set of known plain text. So it makes the attack more effective. So now what we need to do is extend the attack across uh, repeated target values. So remember the figure before, we were trying to uh, learn some information about this plain text block. Well, let's say that we've got the same value, little p, that appears in a number of these blocks. Well, for every one of these uh, ciphertext blocks here, we know that the, um, you know, the value of that exclusive word with this is, you know, excluded from what this could possibly be. So for every time that this little p appears, we can exclude a, a whole big range of uh, potential plain text values. So this actually enables us to you know, put together a reasonable attack. So if we have an unknown repeated value of repetition r and little s number of possible <coughs> plain text, then we can uh, actually exclude, we can make a, a possible attack here by excluding all of the possible plain text until we winter them out and we just have one value that remains, and that's the value of the plain text. So uh, this actually works um, when there's uh, s possible plain text and uh, k known values and repetition of r. Right? When uh, we have you know, k times r greater than you know, this value, which is um, you know, something like w times 2 to the w, then the attack works. And these numbers, you, you might notice, are um, it's harder to do these attacks than it is to do the, the CBC attacks. And I'll go through the algorithms here. But you know, first a heuristic on you know why does this attack work, right? And you know why does it work with this success probability? So, what's the size of the set? You know, when we take the uh, you know the direct sum of the two sets, right? Of the you know, capital epsilon, the um, capital G here. Well, if we assume that it's the you know k times r, which actually you know appears to be a reasonable estimate then we can imagine that we're collecting coupons where, you know, little s again is the number of possible plain text, right? So we're doing something like a coupon collector problem here. <coughs> so when we actually go to do this attack in practice, then what do we have? We have, um, we could do a sieving approach and, you know, loop over, you know, the, the, uh, the epsilon, the set of blocks of, that are the, uh, the cipher outputs and then loop over the uh, there are different repetitions, and then we can just remove the exclusive order of these you know, from the set of possible plain text. And then once we're done doing that a lot of times, then we, you know, we figured out the right value. We're going to do something that's more like a, uh, we could do something that's more like a searching approach. 
and we could uh, loop over possible plain text, and then for each repetition, then uh, we could search to see um, if it's in the, the set epsilon, and if it is, then we can remove it from the set of possible plain text. So, let me go back on this one. So the sieving approach is going to take, you know, k times r operations and s storage. And the searching approach is going to take rs operations and r plus k storage, right? So this searching approach has um, a little better on storage. So you can actually make a hybrid al algorithm out of these, which is, uh, you know, slightly better. Because sieving is better when k is less than s, right? And the uh, searching algorithm is better otherwise. So the first few passes of the sieving algorithm will actually greatly reduce the possible plain text set size. So you can make a hybrid algorithm. And you, know, you can run the sieving one first and then the searching one later. And then you can improve that by noticing that you can actually divide this set epsilon into two distinct sets and use one in one phase and one in the other phase. So, so it's possible to you know, improve on that a bit. So I want to go ahead and, and wrap up the, the presentation with some conclusions here. I think the most important conclusion is that you know, the CBC and uh, CFB encounter all leak information about the plain text at the birthday bound. And uh, you know, even when you know, if they're used right at the birthday bound, and um, you know, a great amount of information is encrypted. You know, with the succession of keys going right up to the birthday bound. You know, again, that's going to leak um, you know, a decent amount of information. And there are some practical attacks that exploit this. And it's a security risk if you're running at high data rates or if you're encrypting a, a large volume of information with a fixed key. And so these can be exploited by practical attacks. The attacks seem especially practical for CBC. And, you know, a little bit more uh, hard, especially storage-wise, if you're going to going to attack counter mode. So what's really interesting is that counter leaks information more slowly in the, uh, in the known plaintext model, right? So, and the, the intuition for this is, right, if you're doing the collision attack, then you end up with, uh, you know, this is how you learn your information. The exclusive or of two plaintext blocks is going to equal some value. And if you're doing that same attack on counter mode, then what you're gonna learn is that the exclusive or of, of some values is not equal to something. Right? So you know, this is a lot more information. The equality is a lot more information than the inequality. So that concludes my presentation and I want to thank you for your attention. motivated by practice and specifically uh, trying to provide a warning on uh, you know, when you should not use triple test to be uh, really honest. You know, that's an interesting question about CFB and I think what's also interesting is, you know, I haven't, you know, none, none of this work that I presented is, is discussed any of the more modern modes of operation, you know, OCB or uh, uh, C, E, N, C your encryption mode, which you know, would look uh, much better than any of these. So, it's, uh, I think it would be you know, interesting to you know, apply this to some other modes of operation and see you know, how well they actually fare, how plain text recovery attacks work, not just in distinguishability.
Dan, you have a question. It, it seems that um, the, the extra security you're talking about for counter mode is minimized if there's if there are two choices for um, a plain text for each plain text block. That gives the minimum extra security for counter mode. And to get the maximum security from what you were saying about a good quality versus inequality, you'd want the maximum number of choices for each plain text block. So would you recommend compressing your plain text in order to maximize the number of uh, choices of each plain text block? You know, I, I'm not sure that um, it, you know, compression is going to be uh, an effective solution. To, you know, I don't think one should try to get security through compression. Um, you, you could, you know, actually, um, you could go to uh, homophonic coding on top of counter or something like that, right? Which would be a perfectly valid way to try to achieve better security here, right? So that there's, you, know, you could encode in multiple ways and um, you know, add some redundancy that way. Um, make it so that the, the, the crypt analyst, uh, you know, had, it was facing more redundancy.